The world we live in is an amazing one, full of passion, wonderment, and of course, fine wine. This is the story of one man's journey to fully understand and appreciate that world. So kick the tires and light the fires. It's time to ride between the wines. It's Burgundian in style. Just a whisper of cherry. Very nice legs. This is so perfectly balanced. Such an old world style. Is this lace with tobacco? A total fruit bomb. I say, so fancy! <laughs> And we're on. Uh, so, uh, welcome to my car for Ride Between the Wines. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, so, Stefano. Hi, everybody. This is this is only my second video one, and actually it was all audio, so don't. Uh, oh, okay. He right. he found out three seconds ago when I turned this on. He goes, "Oh shit, it's on, <laughs> it's on video." I hope I look good. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you're from Opeach. You're in town today from Chicago, and yes. you're from Opeachy Wines. Yes. Uh, and I'm super happy to have you. We just had our first tasting, and everything in the bag is amazing. Thank um, you. And I'm a big supporter of a lot of your wineries as it is. Uh, so can you just start off and tell me? Uh, how you got into the business? Sure. Um, I'm going to go backwards because okay. um, I started in restaurants, but when I was in restaurants, I, I really loved it. I worked in a small family owned restaurant, then I really I worked my way up, to, way up to fine dining. And I liked doing it, but I didn't like the hours. So I realized, I said, you know, I really would like to work um, as a supplier, specifically, um, because I feel like that's where my strengths were, and uh -huh. I have friends that were doing that, um, and when I talked to them about it, they said, you know, this would be a good fit for you, but you, it's very difficult to go from being, working in a restaurant to being in, as a supplier, so mm -hmm. I worked my way backwards, so I've been at Opeachy for two years, before that I worked for Frederick Wildman and Sons for 11 years. Um, and before that, I worked as a sales rep um, doing on-premise accounts in Chicago for a company in Chicago called Jug and Dolph, which is now the Words Beverage Group, was Words Beverage Group. So, um, and then before that, I worked in restaurants. So I basically said, okay, I want to get to here. And in order to do that, I have to do these other things first. So, so you had the, the plan all in mind. The plan all in I like mind. That. So okay. I worked my plan. Yes. And that's how I got into it. now that you're living the plan, you happy? I am, yeah. I really like it. It's hard, but I like our business has changed. It's become a lot more competitive, and the supplier side is hard because you have to work through other people. Mm -hmm. So um, the biggest challenge for me was the instant gratification of not making a sale on the spot. Um, and I look at things from a very macro standpoint. So I look at things from like a thirty thousand foot view. So that's not always easy to get things record. done when you're looking at some from so far up. Hmm. How, how often do you find yourself actually in the car with reps like today? Um, probably once a month. Okay. So still, not still a, fair a ton, but... Um, and how many states did you say you're over? I cover 24 states with a team of four. So um, I travel a lot, but not too much. It's very strategic what I do. Um, because I manage a large team and I'm on the executive team of our company, um, it is much harder for me to get out there and see customers and work with reps and mm -hmm. um, see customers. But it's, as far as I'm concerned, if you lose touch with that, you're not going to make it in this industry because we're still a relationship based industry. So if you stop working in the market and think you're too big for it and um, don't have time, or you know, quote unquote, don't have time, you're not going to make it. Well, yeah. that's, I think that's half of the reason of having suppliers in the car. I mean, you, yeah, we're showing off the wines, but it's really getting to meet people. Oh, for sure. You know, yeah. So, um, well, good. Well, uh, well, welcome to South Carolina. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to kind of use a couple of these little tidbits in between to kind of talk about some of the different wineries that you guys have, because you do have a lot of... Uh, Opeachy is uh, mostly all Italians. Uh, Correct. Uh, so could you tell me, before we actually get into the wineries, how Opeachy started in the family? Sure. Um, it's a bit of a long story, but I'll try to keep it con concise. We have five um, minutes. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the OP, it's a fourth generation family owned winery. Okay. Or excuse me, family owned importer. So the current generation is Don and Dina Opici. Okay. Um, their mother, Linda, is still involved as our president. 
Um, but it was really Hubert Opeachie, which is Don and Dina's grandfather, Linda Opeachie's father, that built the company into what it is today. Um, it was his father that basically founded the company before Prohibition, mm -hmm. and then when Prohibition happened, it obviously went dark, and then um, Hubert's father reopened it after Prohibition ended. Um, but it's a very small percentage of companies make it to the fourth generation. Um, I want to say it's something like less than 10%. So we're very proud of the fact that we're still family owned. Um, we have, you know, the, the Opeaches are really wonderful people. They're business people, of course. Um, but there, there's very much a sense of family in our company, which everyone who works for the company understands and very much appreciates. Um, now, when, when uh, Opeachy acquires new wineries, is that, are they actually buying the wineries or are they just bringing them to America? Um, we... But, well, so some we purchase the juice, so okay. we don't have wineries. Okay. But we we source from a winery or from a cooperative for some of our brands, okay. especially our our bulk wine. We call them bulk wines, like our cookie wines. Oh, okay. Um, where we'll just purchase from a winery under our own name. Um, others, of course, we contract directly with the winery. We, we represent their brands. Um, but Opeachy has a collection of our own brands like La Luca Prosecco, um, Auspician brands from California, um, Desteo Cava from Spain, and it's all our own. It's our own label, but we purchase the juice from someone else. Okay. And those I cannot tell you who we purchase from. So. Wait, because you don't know or because it's proprietary? Because it's proprietary information. <laughs> um, well, so... Um, Kind of in the pro progression, what, what's what's the first, um, what's, what's the oldest big house that I would know the name of that you guys, like Chisari, that's a huge brand, is that one of right, your flagships or one of your... Um, yeah, Chisari is our flagship that we've been with for a long time. Carpinetto, I would say, is probably one of the closer, still family-owned um, wineries that are part of the fabric of Opeachy. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Carpinetto would be one, um, Umberto Cesare, so there's Cesare and then there's Umberto Cesare. Umberto Cesare is from Emilia Romagna. They're another one that we've had for a very long time, um, and the partnership goes back quite a ways. Uh, Sebastian Rue from Burgundy is another one that we've had for quite some time. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah. I do think those, those few really show how long we've had these partnerships and relationships. And and who is, um, you, you mentioned Don, and who are the current, gen the fourth generation? Dina, his sister Dina. Don and Dina, okay. So Dina runs our distribution network. So we have our own distributors in six states. Okay. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, the Mid-Atlantic, and Florida. And Dina runs that part of it, even though she kind of oversees everything, but she runs that part, and Don runs the import side. And who are Julia and James? Julia and James, which is the name of our, one of our brands from California called Julia James, are Dina's children. Okay. Don has two children, Logan and Luca. And Luke, that our Prosecco is named La Luca, so they've named a Prosecco in his honor. So, Julia and James have wines in their honor. Yes. Luke, Luca, has the wine in his honor. Yes. And Logan has what? Something pending. So. More proprietary secrets. Yes. <laughs> We're going to have a follow-up next time. <laughs> when I'm back with you, yes. <laughs> well, a uh, spoiler alert. Uh, Logan's wine is going to be named after Wolverine. Oh, this guy right. doesn't want to tell. He, he doesn't want to He doesn't want to let anybody know, but it's going to be a Wolverine or a Wino X name. i got to look it up, yeah. i got to so. figure something out. Creative to include his name. So I love it. All right, well, cool. Well, we're about to walk into this shop, uh, but... Um, yeah, we'll be back on in a second. Great, thank you. All right, back in the car. Um, so, let's talk All about right. Viberti. I don't know where we left off, but that's the Barola that just made an impression on me. So, right. Um, tell me, tell me about that family and what that wine is. It's spelled V I B E R T I. It'll yes. Be in the notes. Um, so the family is third generation, family owned, um, and operated winery. Okay. They. 
really started his restaurant tours with a, a restaurant called Buon Padre, and that's what the Barolo is named after. So uh, their flagship Barolo, I should say. Okay. And they make others, and they make a lot of different wines, but in general, it's a smaller operation. Um, Buon Padre is still open today. We can go eat there. Yes, if you were in the oh, Barolo so region, you could go. I don't know. I don't remember exactly where it is, but I have been there. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's still open today. How's um, the food? The food is delicious. Uh, it was, it's not his, it's not uh, Claudio Viberti, who's the current generation that runs the winery. It was his mother um, was the chef, basically. Okay. So she's still involved and kind of oversees things, but is not actively working in the restaurant any longer. Um, so they make a lot of different wines. They're really known for their Barolo, but they make a delicious Longhi Nebbiolo. They make a Barbera that is hard to keep in stock because it's so... Um, so well well uh, liked by consumers. It's called oh. La Jamella. So La Jamella means the twin. A Jamella is a twin. Okay. So La Jamella is the twin because Claudio's mom is a twin. So there's a picture uh, of two women's faces on the label okay. and that is his mom and his mom's sister. And they recently opened a second restaurant in downtown Barolo called La Jamella. So they have is it an identical restaurant to Bon Padre? No. Well, so... see, that doesn't fit the thing. It should be a twin. Sorry, well, go ahead. I'm just kidding. I'm just well, kidding. Well, what do they call a twin that's not... Is it fraternal yeah, or something? Yeah, they're so... not identical. Right, not yeah. identical twins. But La Jamella is very modern cuisine, okay. and Bon Padre is very classic, traditional cuisine. So, um, first, I definitely want to try both of these. Uh, but uh, second, the modern versus traditional brings up uh, a question for me. Yes. I know the answer because I was just drinking it, but um, I feel like um, Barolo is one of the big wines where you hear people talk about how stylistically different the traditionalists versus the more modern techniques are. And I yes. feel like one of the biggest things is um, wood. Mm -hmm. uh, so so where does um, Buon Padre and Viberti's uh, Barolo fall on that argument, and, and do they have strong feelings one way or the other, or...? Well, I, I, uh, they, so with their wood, they don't use any toasted oak. It's all steamed oak barrels. So oak. they steam the inside. Um, and they, because they do not want to impart um, a lot of toasted flavors okay. in the, into, the, into the wines. So um, I personally think that they're a little bit more modern. But I don't know what your take is on that. So to some of the other ones well, that I've tried. So. Well, I thought I didn't taste nearly as much oak. I, so I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the steamed oak. That's a very... Uh, it was new to me as well. Uh, I had never heard of it until... So when I, you... Have you have you got to see the inside of the barrels? Do they look like just straight up wood with... We did not see the inside of the barrels because there was wine in them. So when we <laughs> were enough. there. Yeah, so I, I unfortunately, we did not see. Um, but... Um, is that something that um, the, that family's been doing for a while as far as yes, you know? Yes, it is. And I do know other producers, I don't know if they use steamed the same method, uh -huh. but they definitely use older oak barrels because they do not want to impart a lot of flavor because um, otherwise it would be over overwhelming. Right. So Or, or bigger, bigger right, barrels. Bigger, yeah, right. Um, or, yeah, the big, large barrels. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, well, I thought it was delicious. I thought it was... Exactly what I think Barolo is supposed to taste right. like, so, so I enjoyed that a lot. Right. Um, and you guys, we don't have it in the bag today, but they make a Chardonnay too, right? They do make a Chardonnay, and um, it does not undergo malolactic fermentation, so it's got a really kind of bright acidity to it. So they make, they're making Is it unoaked two. also? Um, it's unoaked, but unoaked they're making, they're, okay. they just came out with a second wine that is oaked, um, that is not in the United States yet. It'll probably be here late next year um, and that one will be oaked. Awesome. So, well, so they, make, that, yeah. they make a Moscato, they make Chardonnay, they make Barbera, they make Lange Nebbiolo, they make Barolo. Um, so they do have a nice range but they're not a large producer. Barbaresco? They make a Barbaresco. Yeah. Well cool. Well, Good. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Right. Oh, that's perfect timing too. All right, let's uh, right. let's pop into. Actually, the place we're popping into uh, is Terra Restaurant. Oh, great. so if uh, any of my listeners are local in Columbia, South Carolina, they pour um, the Jamella. Oh, La Jamella. Oh, La nice. Jamella. That's right. We the, had it for dinner when I was there a couple weeks ago. Yeah. 
So if you want to, they actually pour it by the glass. So if you want to try um, the Barbera de Alba that we're talking about, check out Terra. Uh, cool. See you in a minute. All right. Uh, welcome back. We're interrupting your regular show for uh, my new segment where we do definitions about wine to try to add some education to all the, the fun stuff that we're doing. Um, so we are at Terra Restaurant, uh, which is another local restaurant downtown Columbia. If you've never been here, you absolutely should. Uh, and I'm here with Matt Ketchpole, uh, who is the GM and also curates the wine list here. So a very educated palate and very passionate about that and cocktails and everything. So yeah, Matt, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate you having me. It's cool. Um, so the last week's term was acidity. And I feel like the next term, a logical choice to go to is tannin. Uh, so let's just start off and tell us a little bit about what tannin is. Uh, tannin is such kind of an interesting animal in the wine world because I think it's something that gets misused so often mm -hmm. terminology wise mm -hmm. and sort of people misunderstand tannin. Um, at the end of the day, tannin is basically the, um, the, the grippy polyphenol plant part of wine skins, wine stems, oak barrels, things like that. So okay. if, you, if you think of the flavor of like black tea, mm -hmm. black tea is almost entirely tannin. So, okay. you know, that slightly astringent, slightly bitter flavor and, and mouthfeel texture that you get on kind of the middle of your tongue and the front of your palate there um, is tannin. Typically. When somebody when says this wine tastes bitter to me, that's that's what's causing the bitterness. Could be. Could the interesting be. thing too is that people misuse the word bitter a mm -hmm. lot. So it's really, and that's a kind of an important distinction for me, is that um, bitter, a lemon, the juice of a lemon is not bitter typically, right? right. That would be acidic exactly. and that creates yeah. a certain type of astringency, but that's really more acidic. Right. Which is good that you went over acid. Um, the peel, or especially the pith, the white part inside the peel of a lemon might be bitter, okay. right? And black coffee is bitter and tannin is often bitter. So Absolutely. coffee and tea, if you eat a mouthful of almonds with the skin on, that part is tannic on the outside of the skin of the almond. So that's a little bit bitter. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, bitter is definitely the right word, but understanding the word bitter is kind of an important, uh, important part of that. Yeah, and um, another thing, just a, a, as a good distinction, is um, the drying element of it versus. I, I think that Jonathan mentioned last week that acid, um, you feel your mouth salivating a little bit, and so this would be a drying uh, yeah, sensation. So, right. And, as well. Okay. So I use the word astringent to mean something that like sort of like extracts that, which to me right. feels the same way as he's yeah. saying drying. Um, a lot of people say that a wine is grippy and a lot of that grip grippy. comes from tannin. So grippy is that sort of like slight sandpapery feel, the mm -hmm. drying aspect that you get on the palate on your mouth and, and definitely tannin provides that. Yeah. So um, you know, you're getting tannin when you make wine from, obviously you typically see tannin in red wine. Right. Um, white wine, if you see it in white wine, it's gonna be skin contact white wine for the okay. most part. And obviously it's still coming from the skin of the white grape. Right. Um, in red wine, you're seeing people that, that basically macerate and, and press juice and let it sit on the skins for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's where most of the color is coming from from your wine. It's where right. a lot of the tannin and the structure of the wine is coming from. And then You've you also got, mentioned it can come from oak. Yeah, and so and like the barrels is what I was gonna say next. Yeah. It's like, it's really, you know, obviously you're aging wine a lot of times in barrels, often oak. Mm -hmm. um, that wood is providing enough, like a little bit of structure from the wood tannin. And then there's, uh, you know, this whole sector of, of people, and you can kind of argue the merits or, or disincentives to do this, but there are people that add effectively powdered tannin mm -hmm. and, you know, chips and staves and basically ways to cheat without having to put it in the barrel and leave it correct. And that's not necessarily wrong, it's just different. Um, you know, but ultimately that's still basically coming from wood or from plants. Right. Um, is that is that a less expensive option than oak aging? Typically, that that's why they're that? doing it. It's, it's typically it's usually like a, you know I think a new this was years ago I haven't seen the number recently but I mean several years ago I think a new oak barrel was like twelve hundred dollars um, yeah. and it's probably more expensive now. And then you're paying for the real estate and, and, and sitting you got, in there. You got to do all of these yeah. things. So it's like theoretically, if you can take a tank or a or you know something else or a vat of some kind, you can kind of infuse that same flavor and get a little bit of the aging process and a little bit of the structure of the tannin that an oak barrel would provide, but quicker and easier and cheaper, mm -hmm. then there's some incentive to do that, depending on what your goal is as a winemaker. Well, let's go back to not the oak barrels, but you mentioned the red grapes and from the maceration and they have it in the stems and the yeah. seeds and all that. Uh, are particular grape varieties more tannic naturally than other ones? Yeah, for sure. So things that jump out to me as being like super tannic are things like, um, like to not and probably like really big, strong Grenache, especially Spanish Grenache, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, in, in, inherently, because genetically the grapes are different, inherently there are some grapes where like just because of the skin contact, they're gonna have more natural tannin than others. 
Um, and you know, these are plants. So obviously grapes, a fruit, it's a crop, it's a whatever. Each, each year and harvest could be a little bit different, but, but between genetically between different species of grapes, basically, there's definitely a, uh, um, there, there are things that I think of as being fuller, more structured wines, and a lot of the times those tend to be more tannic. Mm -hmm. The kind of the interesting thing though is that every once in a while you'll see somebody take what would be thought of as a super tannic grape, but give it very little, very limited skin contact, contact or they'll age it in steel or in concrete or whatever, and so you see reduced expression of the tannin in a grape that is typically a more tannic grape, which right. is kind of a neat thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so there's not a hard and fast rule, but there definitely are some wines that you consider to be grippier and more tannic for sure, and I would think like, like big, bold, um, you know, like maybe some uh, some petite verdot sometimes if it sits on the skin, but for sure, like Spanish Grenache for me, like Priorat, mm -hmm. um, Tanat for sure, some Mouvedre, although Mouved can sometimes be sort of on the lower tannin side also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times Cabernet, especially like in Bordeaux, when they leave it in that French oak for a while or whatever, like a lot of times you see solid tannin there. What, what, what would be on the far other side? What's well, uh, you know, very, 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 very like elegant uh, French Burgundy and Beaujolais and things like that, kind of like Gamay. Pinot Noir, Gamay. Yeah, yeah, Pinot Noir and Gamay. Gamay. Sorry, yeah. excuse me. Pinot Noir and Gamay. Mm -hmm. um, on the other end of the scale could probably, I know I just said that it right. sometimes <laughs> can be super tannic, but sometimes if they don't, if they just press it real lightly, uh -huh. you get real light um, stuff. We do a fair amount of Val de Gay. We do a lot of other stuff. But basically, if you're looking at that glass of wine and it's got a like really, really, really light or ruby color and it's like almost totally translucent there is a strong possibility that that is has reduced tannin because a lot of the tannin obviously a lot of that plant which matter is giving it that really dark rich inky yeah. color mm -hmm. um, you know the juice from wine is very seldom that, that, color. that color right right and so that's coming from something so if you're seeing a wine that doesn't have a lot of that big rich inky color oftentimes it's going to have reduced tannin um, you know mm -hmm. I, I really have been drinking a lot of like uh, German and Austrian stuff recently, and mm -hmm. I, re I really dig Blaufrankisch, and that's like mm -hmm. relatively low, low tannin. Yeah. Um, so you know, but I, you know, I think it's really hard to say these for sure are and these for sure aren't. But there, I would say most commonly, if you're looking, you're at, making it in a traditional style. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. You know, so if you're looking at like warmer climate wines that let their wine, their 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 juice sit on the skins for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are going to be, you know, consistently more tannic than wines that are like sort of lightly pressed, cooler climate wines that are made to be a little more feminine. Although I'm sure we're not supposed to use that word anymore. I still hear it a lot. Well, <laughs> um, oh, I think I think uh, that's all extremely helpful. I, I I have one last question. It would be, what does tannin mean for us when we get in the world of pairing? If you're interested, definitely in the best question. For okay. Sure. Well, then, yes. <laughs> we are in a restaurant. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, what's wine without food? Correct. Right. Um, the really interesting thing, we do a little exercise here with the staff to kind of explain tannin, where we take a wine, and uh, we do actually uh, acidity, tannin, and a couple of other like flavor profiles, basically. Mm -hmm. We add stuff to, like we take four glasses of one wine that's not particularly tannic, it's just sort of like middle of the road, uh -huh. and we'll add black tea to one, and we'll add acid to one, and we'll add whatever, just to kind of see, and this is a pairing cool. exercise, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do that um, kind of in an effort to Put ourselves in the mindset of like, all right, if I have this wine, objectively I like this wine, right? Subjectively I like the wine. Objectively it has these characteristics. What if the tannin were increased? You know, all right, this is doing this thing to my mouth where I've got this dry, bitter, ribby thing mm -hmm. on the palate. What do I want with that? I want probably fat, um, you know, because obviously you want fat. <laughs> um, with acid you want fat, with tannin you want fat. Uh -huh. um, you want to kind of balance the bitterness, balance the stringency with a richer mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. um, having something that is moderately bitter and then having something that's like acidic to go with it, if that's not the wine, it usually will be also acid in that same wine. Um, you know, we, we like to pair those tannic wines with like big, rich, fuller plates for us. You've got effectively light with light in that uh -huh. uh, area, so you've got like big, full-bodied, rich flavors and then a big wine that can cut through it with both the acid and with the tannin. Right. Um, also, another kind of important thing, I know we kind of were talking pairings, but uh, if you're gonna age a wine, mm -hmm. the two things that you want basically more than anything are you want acid and tannin. Um, and the idea is that obviously that's going to be 
become subdued and sort of more nuanced over time. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the game is if you've got these big wines that you want to hold up in the barrel for several years and then in the bottle for 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years after that, mm -hmm. you want it to have good alcohol, good acid, good tannin, and the idea is that those things, those elements of structure, help the wine sort of maintain its integrity. So that you know, I can pair a, a 2000 wine or a 1985 wine or a whatever with your steak that you've got or your hand cut chop right. or whatever. Um, I don't know if that. That's a great. We actually, I think we talked about that with acid too. Just yeah. the important elements. Of it, it is. It is really. Yeah. It's, it's critical. You know, to, to understand a really cool wine like that. I think. I agree. Well, man, this is great. Thank you so much. You've been resource the world of knowledge. <laughs> um, if, if you've never been to a Terra restaurant, like I mentioned before, it's T-E-R-R-A. -R -R uh, I'll flash it on the screen. I figured out how to do words last week. It's amazing. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, you should definitely check it out. The the menu here is obviously amazing. Um, Chef Mike Davis opened it 13 yeah, right, years ago, 13, something around there. Um, absolutely amazing food. Uh, you'll, you'll never be steered wrong. And obviously, um, Matt is always here, usually behind the bar, running around, and he Builds a list, has tried all the wines, obviously can steer you through if you have any questions, and he's he's not overly geeky. He'll he'll be very uh, you know, he'll <laughs> he'll go to the level that you want to listen to. We can be gentle. Yeah, be gentle. <laughs> um so yeah, well, appreciate it, Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks, dude. Alright, we are back in the car, and so what just happened was what just happened, what had happened was um we just tasted some Vino Sia, which is a winery we haven't talked about yet. Yes. We had their Greco de Tufo. Um, and Tara has also brought that in, so in the next week or so, you'll be able to try it for yourself. Um, but here's the deal. When we were in there, the buyer, um, Matt uh, Catchpole, said, Hey, Mike, what do you think about coming in and doing a staff training? <laughs> and I said, I would love to. Um, right. But then Stefano here says, Yeah, man, I would do it myself if I lived here, but I can't. So I thought... How about I just let you record your staff training and tell us about Vinicius Greco de Tufo, <laughs> and when I get there, I'll just show them this clip, and I don't actually have to do any work. What do you think? Uh, we could certainly like, <laughs> try to do that. <laughs> uh, all right, so... <laughs> Well, so, so I, listen up. Well, hang listen on, up, because servers. Well, well, hang on, because normally I would look at the menu ahead of time, and I would say, I would talk about the wine, but I would also pick out certain dishes uh, that the wine would pair very nicely with. All right, well, that'll be my homework part, okay. and I'll just let you talk about the grape and the wine. Great, because that's okay. how. That, all right, we're going to tag team this. We'll all do right. his part first. So Vinosia <laughs> um, is a winery that's from the Campania region. So if you know the Amalfi Coast. Uh, or, or have heard of it or want to look it up on, on uh, a search engine and take a look at it. Um, it's the beautiful part of southwestern Italy. Um, and this is a wine, it's called Greco di Tufo, that is the grape as well. It's one of, how many grapes are there in Italy? Like 3,000 grapes? <laughs> yeah, something So like that. anyways, the, it's one of the many grapes um, that is indigenous to this part of um, the country. And when you taste it, you'll notice that it's got a really nice kind of a, a rounder mouthfeel, um, really nice acidity to it, and nice minerality. So even though I don't know the menu, I ate at Terra a couple weeks ago, but I don't remember um, the menu, but I did have fish. And this is something that I think would go really beautifully with fish, um, or like a light poultry mm -hmm. type of, of a dish. Um, but it's nice because you're giving your guests something different to taste rather than a Pinot Grigio or Chardonnay. This grape they've never heard of called Greco de Tufo, although Matt did say they sell, they sell a Greco de Tufo. They do, so, yeah. um, But with Vinosia, you have um, a winery that was founded by one of the uh, three brothers that founded another winery um, that was very successful globally. And he branched out on his own and is now making Vinosia. So they're fairly new to the United States. Um, and, and, and the other winery, can we say the name of them? <clears throat> oh, Fuego oh. de San Gregorio. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a, another very acclaimed, excuse me, uh, a winery for the region. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when you said sure. that, my ears pricked up. Right, they so um, they made great stuff. He just wanted to branch out on his own and start a Vinosia. So um, you have very high quality in, in the glass, sustainably farmed vineyards. Mm -hmm. um, and then this region of southern Italy that is just so beautiful and, um, you know, pairs very nicely with, with what's in the bottle. I agree. I think it's 
Outstanding. This is the first day, so um, we're about to go in, so we will maybe touch on the um, Alianico that we're tasting in the bag also, and then the Negro Maro that I didn't grab in the bag, but I'm excited to taste. But uh, Vina Sia has uh, been showing extremely well today, so nice. I'm enjoying it. Do you that. want me to talk about the Alianico? Uh, yeah, let me see. we got a minute a here. A little bit of time. So uh, the Alianico is um, it's actually Tarasi. Um, named Sant'Andrea, so the subregion Tarasi, and then Sant'Andrea. Um, it's 100% Alianico, and Alianico is a very tannic and acidic grape, which usually needs a lot of time in the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, but what Luciano is trying to do is make the wine that is um, more approachable sooner, so you don't have to wait 10 or 12 years or 15 years to drink it, um, but it ha it's, it's if there's not a Cabernet on a wine list, it would be, I think, a good alternative because it it offers a lot in the in the bottle and a lot in the glass. If there's um, not a Cabernet on a wine list. Well, you know, I worked in a restaurant that had only Italian wines, oh, and okay. if it had not, we had 900 wines on the wine list, and there was not one single 100% Cabernet. Hmm. So if a guest came in and wanted a Cabernet, we didn't have a Cabernet to give them. If they wanted Chardonnay, we didn't have Chardonnay. To give so yes, it is possible. Yeah. But <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> in a, in I a take rare back my snack comment. <laughs> or if you just want to give your guests something different, and then you know, just give them an experience. So oh, wonderful. Well, um, yeah. Well, we're about to pull over and park and have some lunch and maybe some glasses of some very auspicious cabernet. Um, but uh, we'll be back in a minute. Thanks. All right. So we're back in the car, and we're now realizing that apparently I need to do something about the lighting. So apologies, it's that time wrong, of day. We're going the wrong direction. I know we could. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're gonna just not taste with the people on this side of town. Um, <laughs> all right, so we're back in the car. Ha have had a great day of tasting so far. Um, I wanted to. I kind of asked you a little bit off air, and your answer was interesting to me. Um, so I falsely assumed that you were from Italy because your last name's Francini. Yes. And. I was like half right, but half wrong. But right. answer me again. So, is your family Italian? No. And tell me why not. <laughs> my fa both of my parents are from a small republic inside of Italy called San Marino. So it's a 24 square mile republic with about 55,000 um, inhabitants. And, and it's, our pa it's a separate country. So our passports don't say San. San, they don't say Italy, excuse me, they say Republic of San Marino. I assume Euros, right? They're still yep. part so of Yep, so it's and... it's interesting because they are part of the EU, they're, um, they use the Euro, mm -hmm. um, a lot of, you know, similar things to Italy, but you do cross a border when you go into, into San Marino, um, there are different laws in San Marino um, that, are, that are separate from Italy. And you, and you said San Marino is in Emilia Romagna? It is. It's in, uh, it's, we fly into Bologna. Okay. And then it's about a one hour drive from Bologna to San Marino. And they're very, it's a landlocked country, but they're about 20 minutes from the Adriatic coast um, by a very popular beach town called Rimini. And Rimini um, has been rated one of the top 100 best beaches in the world, so um, very popular in Italy. And you spent a lot of time there? I did. So I was very lucky as a kid to be able to go to San Marino with my parents um, and stay for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess ironically, my family is in San Marino, owns the largest beverage, like wine and beer uh, beverage wholesaler in San Marino and that area of the country. So Wait, wait, wait. Who? Who owns that? My uncle, my aunt and uncle. Oh. So when I was a kid, they had, they had a store. I would be stocking, you know, I'd be working in their store on rainy days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be stocking bottles of wine and, and helping them in the store. And on sunny days, I'd go to the beach. So. What did you, uh, what, what was the role of alcohol in your life growing up? Um, you know, no, no one in my family is a big drinker, okay. including myself. Um, but... On special occasions, it was very common for me to have a glass of water with wine in it, even when I was like single digits. Uh -huh. I remember having that, and not a lot, just you know, a little glass. Um, so alcohol has always been, 
I've been surrounded by it, but we, we were taught to respect it. Um, you know, in Italy, there is no drinking age. I mean, they're really, they're, I think it's 14 or 15, uh -huh. but people drink at a younger age. But And some people abuse it, but for the most part, when you start drinking sooner and it's part of everyday life, you respect it more. Um, as a matter of fact, I was reading, and it's not about Italy, but it's about France, that um, they don't regard wine as alcohol. They regard it as a drink, like water. It's, it's so, well, that's how wine it is be. so ingrained in their, in their culture that to have a glass of wine at lunch is like having a, an iced tea. You know, yeah. They don't think of it as, now they think of beer or liquor as alcohol, but not wine. So, it's interesting that beer has a distinction over it. Right. <clears throat> so in Italy, wine is part of lunch and dinner. Well, so um, are there any other differences um, with San Marino and the surrounding areas? Well, I mean, not really. Because all I know than... is like the Vatican is the only other time I've heard of something like this. In right, that's... right. Well, I mean, there's def different dialect, of course, if you're... I'm, as a San Marino citizen, I'm Samarinese, so there's a Samarinese dialect. Okay. Um, and otherwise, there's not a lot of differences. However, it's a different government, obviously, because it's not part of Italy. So the government in, it, in San Marino is governed by a party, but every six months, the leadership of that party changes. San, the Republic of San Marino has been, was founded in 301 AD. So the, the government has been the same the entire time. They've never changed the format. So what the one challenging thing in San Marino is getting anything done. Because yeah, in six as soon months, as you get in there, you're you can't time to really go. do yeah. something. Um, even though the party isn't is, which would be like say the Democrats are, are in office for five years, but every six months the leader of that party changes, hmm. along with other cabinet members. Right. So how do you ever get anything done? Yeah, that done? sounds ridiculous. So, it, a very popular topic in San Marino, if you go to a local um, bar or something to have a coffee, it's always politics. Because they, it's so backwards and so <laughs> kind of messed up, they can't get anything done. So, But it, it's a lovely country. Um, the food is fantastic. The people are great. Um, so yeah, it's a nice little, That's it's cool. a nice different history. Cause mo it's odd to hear someone that knows of San Marino. Most people don't or have never heard of it. Yeah. Or they've heard of it and they're like, oh my gosh, I've met somebody from San Marino. So. Well, now I can say that. There you go. Yes. <laughs> You're uh, welcome. <laughs> all right, well, uh, let's, we're, we're going over to the garage here. I was hoping, I feel like nobody on my podcast has talked about DM Cork, but I know um, a couple of different wineries that you have are using it. Um, do you want to speak to that, what sure. DM of Cork is? So uh, DM is D. I A M. It's a company that has uh, on, a, on a cork has kind of a circular little stamp on the cork, mm -hmm. and they have patented a process of taking real cork and they grind it down to a powder. They remove the TCA and then they compress the cork back together naturally. So, um, with I'm sure with some type of compound, but yeah. it's all it's you know it's not I mean chemicals of any sort. Um, but what that does is you have a 100% guarantee of not having a cork bottle of wine. Um, I first saw them with French wines mm -hmm. uh, when I used to sell a big French portfolio. Um, and now I see them a lot in Italy. I don't sell a lot of California wine, so I don't know if they're doing it, but I would not be surprised if they are. Um, and it's just, it's a really nice selling point and something to point out to customers, not just to the customers we sell to, but to right. their guests. Because, um, you know, it, it is real cork. Um, it, it has the closure of like a real cork. You can use um, the Coravin on it. And it's just really nice to have that guarantee. Because especially with a bottle, you need the cork to expand, especially a burgundy bottle. Mm -hmm. um, and synthetic corks don't expand, whereas this does. So um, we don't know what the process is because it's a, it's a proprietary process um, but it's it's a really nice point to tell people about any, any idea what the what the price of that versus you know, screw cap versus, um, you know 
I don't know exactly, but I do know that it's obviously more than cord, but less than school cap. Yeah. So, uh, but it's not a significant amount more. And, and with as competitive as wine has become, mm -hmm. winemakers are willing to make the investment to have that closure and, and tell the story of why Diam is better because they want guests to be comfortable with their wine. Well, if you, I mean, the amount of bottles of wine that are corked. Isn't it 5%? I, mean, I think that's the, the number. It's a bottle in a case, you know. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot to be thrown away. And then I think the one of the worst things is that... Oh, better lighting. <laughs> for a second. Um, is, you know, one of the things I fear most is the idea that somebody's going to take a wine that I know is a great wine, they're going to buy it, drink it, and just think it's a crummy wine. Right. And never try that bottle again. Right. I, I feel like it's a good point. You don't, you don't have, recognize cork tain if you don't know. If you don't know, know what better. it is, yeah. right? No, that's a, a very good point about it. So, so great. well, cool. Well, tell your winemakers, you give them the thumbs up on going. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're about to pull over and taste at the Vino Garage. So, All right. we'll be right back. All right. This is the end of our day. Yes. Uh, any any final words championing your wines or you know Mike it's been wonderful I've had a really good time today and a lot of fun and it's, it's thank you the same the videos uh, I appreciate it Opichi you know we're family owned and the relationships make a huge difference and for us awesome. um, so it's been great and working with RNDC and you today has been really fantastic so thank you appreciate, appreciate it. it thank you yep